This is an oral history interview with Charles Moore, Norris in his home on September 27, 1982. The interviewer is Susan Gortner. Mr. Norris, where were your mother and father born? Well, my, my mother came from Reading, Pennsylvania with her family. I suppose she was born there. I suppose. And my grandfather came from Ohio. I, I don't know where he, whether he was born there or not. He come here and he was in... I shouldn't talk. That's all right. Go ahead. Huh? Go ahead. That's fine. Well, my grandfather came from Ohio, Daniel Norris, and he was, he come before the Civil War because she lived out north of here on a farm while he was in the, in the Army. In the Civil War? In the Civil War. Where did he fight in the Civil War? In Tennessee, I think. Did you ever know, did you know him? Did you know your grandfather? Well, yeah, I stayed with him when I went to high school. Did he tell you stories about the Civil War? Yes. Can you tell us any of them? <laughs> and he told one time about in the battle, <laughs> and a fella got, uh, fella got shot with a spent bullet, you know, and just just went in there and took his clothing in with it, you know, didn't hurt him, didn't kill him. Huh. <laughs> and, I don't remember other many other stories that he told about. I remember that. Was he wounded at all? No. So your father was born in Monticello then, or in this yes. area? Yes. Yes. And your mother was born. She must have been born in, in Reading, Pennsylvania. My mother, and they moved here to Western Illinois. Then they moved to there the model cellar. Mm -hmm. What were their names? Uh, my grandfather and my mother it was Wendell Eshelman, and his wife was Hannah Eshelman. And what was your mother's name? Mary, Mary Emma. Mm -hmm. And what was your father's name? Frank Willis. What type of work did your father do? Well, he he mostly a laborer. As I remember, when I was a kid, labor was hard. To, it was hard to get work, you know, back about '98 and along there. He worked as a carpenter part time, and he was a policeman part time. And then we moved to a country, and he he worked for worked as a farmhand, you know, mm -hmm. run, run the it was a livestock farm owned by the Dytons. We lived there about four or five years. Was he a policeman in Monticello? Yes. I know he was a night policeman one one time. That's all I remember. Mm -hmm. uh, Did they have a uniform? No. No. I, not that I know. Uh -huh. No, he didn't. How long did your parents attend school? No, well, I couldn't tell you. I don't know. Okay. When did your first ancestors settle in the United States? I don't know. Okay. Did your mother ever work outside the home? She worked in the tailor shop. My grandfather Wendell Eshelman was a tailor, and she was a seamstress in, in, the, in the tailor shop. It was the tailor shop in Monticello? Yes. Where was it located? Well, it was located in the in the Rhodes Building first. That's where the National Bank is now. And uh, 
And then they was located on the east side upstairs. I don't remember. I don't remember when he first, where he was at first. Mm -hmm. What was the name of the shop? Well, just just a tailor shop. How many years did your mother work there? Well, she must. Have Must have been five or six years before she, before she was married. Before she was married, probably five or six years. How long after she quit working there did this tailor shop remain open? Well, my grandfather run up to he died, and then my uncle William Ashen, when he took it over, and he he lived to oh six or eight years ago. Uh -huh. He run it by him by himself then. Hmm. How many brothers and sisters did you have? I was had two brothers and two brothers, three, four sisters. Were you the youngest or the oldest or in the middle? I was the oldest. Oldest. I got word that my sister now is the only one who's living and she's in the hospital in bad shape. Oh, that's too bad. She called, called my son in Decatur. Uh -huh. So she not, not like to get out, I guess, at the time. Did anyone live with your family besides your brothers and sisters? No. Where were you born? I was born in Mount Solomon. The house was in the south end somebody, I don't remember, it's gone. Mm -hmm. Did you live in several houses in Monticello and several areas as you grew up? Well, yeah, we lived in the, up here on Grant Street about, the second house from the, on the north side, it's been, it was just, it was a one, uh, three or four, I guess four room. Mm -hmm. And it didn't have any foundation, just piers, you know. Most of the houses had piers those days, you know, just brick piers. And uh, it has been remodeled and that was remodeled into a two-story building now. And, that's, and uh, we lived there and my grandfather lived across on the corner there in that house that's there now. Mm -hmm. With Eshelman. Where else did you live when you were growing up? Well, down on the farm. We lived on the Dighton farm, and we lived out on the England farm east of Monticello mm -hmm. for th when I was going to high school. Did did you help with chores around the house and around the farm? Yeah, my brother and I had to furnish the wood. We had to cut all the wood. <laughs> Cook stove and heating stove. You know, we had we had to get it before and after school. Where did you get the wood? They had timber there. We when hauled you, it in. When you were out on the farm? Yeah, they had it was timber. Mm -hmm. It was four hundred acres and they had a lot of timber down on Long Sangamon River. Now this was the uh, Dighton farm? Dighton farm. What other chores did you help with? Well, we had to run the washing machine, <laughs> you know. The a washboard or a washing machine, you know. We had one that rubbed back and forth, uh -huh. you know. Like you did that. We had to do that, and we had to we had to do the dishes too. <laughs> and then we, in the evening, they'd put us in the kitchen to do the dishes, you know, and mom would be in the room. We'd fuss about it. We wasn't allowed to drive to it once, you know. <laughs> uh, we're telling them, why don't you drive to it once now? <laughs> Come out and sell it because you were afraid we'd break them, you know. Uh -huh. 
Did you have any jobs when you were growing up that you earned a little money? Yeah, down there on that Dyden farm we hoed when we was 12, 13, 14 along there. We hoed wild sweet potatoes out of the corn, 50 cents a day. Bill, Bill and I, that's my brother. Uh -huh. We, <laughs> and the day was sun up and sun down. <laughs> the men would be plowing, you know, and we had to hold those vines, wild sweet potatoes out of the vine. They catch the corn and then break it off. You know, the vines were uh -huh. catching the plow and uh, tear the corn down. We had to hold them off. You never get rid of them, they come up again. What did you do with your earnings? Well, I just spent it on the, didn't want very much to spend it on things. My father took it and we'd go to, we'd go out twice a year to town and about 10 miles down there. We'd come to the fair, Pyatt County Fair, and then we'd come, about the only time we'd get into it town would be the Pike County Fair on the 4th of July. We always got got those two things. Mm -hmm. Drive 10 miles with a slow horse and a slow team to make it to town. So you only came in about twice a year when you lived out on the farm? That's about all the time we got to town. Mm -hmm. You didn't come in when they came in to buy groceries and things? No. No, no. How often would they come in to buy groceries? Well, we come in here not very often, but we went to Cisco was three and a half miles. Uh -huh. You go there, I don't know how often, probably a week. Probably went in there Saturday, maybe, I don't remember. Where did you go to school? Well, there was a schoolhouse half mile. It's Oak Grove School. Mm -hmm. It's still down there. Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Uh, her name is Bessie Armsworth, and she married Joe Raycraft to run the, the drugstore. Oh, Melba Raycraft. Well, that was that married her son. That was yeah, her. She, she married. She married money. Joe. The, mm -hmm. And she bought that and fixed it up for old oh, place just to go down, you know, and have a party or something like that. The old schoolhouse? Yeah, the old schoolhouse. And it was called, what was it called? Oak Grove. There were oak trees around. Where was it located? It was located a half mile east of the far, west of the farm where she lived and two miles south and a mile east of Cisco. Mm -hmm. I, th I think the building's still there, I guess. Did you walk to school? Yeah, a little half mile. Did you carry your lunch? Yeah. What did you take in your lunch normally? Oh, we had sandwiches, some kind of boiled egg. They used a lot of boiled eggs in, in lunch boxes those days. Boiled egg and maybe cookies. What What did you do in your What was your school day like? Do you recall when, how early you had to be at school? Well, nine o'clock. We had to be there when it took up at nine. And there was there was eight there was first and the first to the tenth grade, mm -hmm. but the, they got so they wouldn't. What was it? they skipped? It had the seventh one year and the eighth the next year. Oh. They didn't have them both one year. So what, if you were supposed to be in seventh grade when they had eighth grade, did you have to take it in opposite order? Yeah, it was, it was arranged so you could do it. Uh -huh. I don't remember now just how it was. 
How many children were about went to that school? About 25. Was it one room, one teacher? Yeah, just one room, one teacher. And after you went to that school, did you go on any place to school? Well, we moved out east of town, and then I went to high school. In Monticello? Monticello. Was that when you lived on the England farm? Yes. I won't, you, they had a pony out there. I drove it in sometimes. Sometimes I walked, and sometimes I skated once in a while. You skated? <laughs> yeah, we had sleet. <laughs> I remember two or three times we had sleet all over the country. We skated, you could skate anywhere. I was about 19, six, five or six or somewhere along there. Did, how long did you attend school in Monticello? Well, I graduated from high school then. How, how big was your graduating class? Eleven. And what year was it? Nineteen seven. Nineteen seven. About how many kids were in the high school? About seventy-five. In all four grades, you know, freshmen to seniors. Mm -hmm. About around seventy-five. Yeah. <clears throat> After you got out of high school, what did you do? Well, work was scarce, you know, and I, I uh, got a school. Mr. McIntosh was superintendent, kind of superintendent. I wondered how I was going to get a certificate. <laughs> and, well, several of us high school kids taught school, you know. Mm -hmm. We got out of school and he'd give a certificate. We couldn't earn it, though. We couldn't get it. But we had to go to summer school the next summer. Uh -huh. you know, for, what was it, eight weeks? Up to normal. We went to normal in Illinois. We had, we got a certificate, but we had to go to school the next summer. Uh, Up at normal again? Yeah, I just yeah. went one summer. Uh -huh. I got. So where did you teach? Well, out of the Dighton School, where Bob Miller's got his, uh, well, what is it? What's he got there? He goes out there and has, uh, and he owns it now, you the know. The cabin or? Yeah, it's a, the house, schoolhouse is still there and he fixed it all up and he has steak fried and so on out mm -hmm. there. Two, or one year there, two years up to Slab Town and one year to Independent. So you taught in three different schools? Yeah. Then I took the uh, they had the rural carrier vacancy here, and I took the exam, got in that, and I quit the teaching school. When you, what did you teach? Did you teach in one room schools? Yes, Were taught you? all four grade, all all grades, from first to first to as many as you had. I had the tenth grade from first to the tenth grade. You had to teach them all. Where did you live when you were teaching school? What? Where were you living when you were teaching school? Well, we lived out on a farm. I stayed there till my father died in 1909. I started teaching in 19, the fall of 1907. He died in 1909. We lived out there two or three years. Then we moved down, moved to Monticello, down on Greenish Street. For and I, let's see, you know, I, we must have lived out in the country four years because I, I, I was out there all while I was teaching. When I come to town where I was, uh, started in on the rural rock mm -hmm. mail business. How did you get to the schools? Did you ride a horse? Yeah, I had a horse, drove a horse and buggy. Mm -hmm. About how many children did you have in the uh, Dighton School? Oh, around 25. And what about the, well, was it Independence and um, what was it, Slabtown? 
Yeah, yeah slab town. How big were they? About the same. They all run about the same, about 25, maybe 25 or 30 people. Slab Town, I go to Slab Town. That, they used to call that Slab Town because they had a lot of slab houses built up there in the early days, you know. It wasn't Slab Town, it was, I think it was Union School. Or what well, was called Union School? It, was, it had another name, but they called it Slab Town. Oh, uh -huh. I don't, I think. I wouldn't be sure whether it was a union or not. I think it was. In the early early pioneers, they built a, built a lot of slab houses out there when they first come along along the river there, mm -hmm. or around close, and they called it Slab Town. What year did you start working for the post office? Well, I I quit teaching. 1911 started in on the rural route. 1911. Where was your rural route? Uh, it was northwest. How were you delivering mail then? Well, I had, I had two horses. Had I had to have two horses. Mail wagon. There was no roads, you know. Muddy. You had to have horses to get around. And. Uh, I bought a mail wagon and a ewe did with the two horses and then when we got in 1912 I, I bought a motorcycle and when good day, good roads I rode the motorcycle. We didn't have any parcel post, you know. Mm -hmm. And I rode the motorcycles when the good weather was good, sometime whenever the road, we didn't have any good roads, you know. They had to drag them, you know, when they froze. And they'd drag the roads and make it smooth. And I, I used that motorcycle to 14 and had to quit on a car to parcel post. They put parcel post in. And when I had, and then I got an old uh, Model T Ford. How long would it take you to do your route when you were using the horses? Oh, I go down, get out of the post office at seven, get your mail up by eight, and leave, and you get back about three o'clock. About how many people did you deliver to on that route? Oh, well, there were about seventy families, I expect, something like that. Mm -hmm. Did everybody have a mailbox at the end of their room? Um, yeah, they, they had to put a mailbox out where you could drive by and, and get on, get on, uh, put it in, you know, from your mail wagon. They had to have it up so you could reach it from the mail wagon, you know, put there. What, what did a mail wagon look like? How was it different than a regular wagon? Well, just a square of them about this wide and high and about that long. About, about uh, six feet. Oh, see, about, about, about three. It, it went on a buggy. It went on buggy wheels, you know. Oh, so uh -huh. The buggy wheels were the same. The wheels were the same as for a buggy. Uh -huh. You mounted it on there. And, oh, I think. Mine was about just room for you to sit here to drive and uh, just two, you know, uh -huh. two. and then about uh, six feet long. And so it was maybe about three feet wide and six feet long? Yeah, about that. And then you sit in the seat and then there's a uh, room up ahead above, you know, maybe it was four feet, I expect. Uh -huh. I used that, you could, I could drive all day in bad weather and keep warm with a, I used a foot warmer. Oh, really? You know, a foot warmer, you put it, it was made about this long and... Which is about a foot or so long? Yeah, about that long and... And it was kind of sloping, you put your feet on it like this. 
Did it. And you heat, you started with a br charcoal brick. You got that a fire when you started, you know, and it'd last all day. Hmm. Keep your keep your feet warm and your middle leg warm. You mm -hmm. Never had any trouble. Keep keeping the weather out or, or suffering from the weather. And what year did you go to driving your car? Well, after they put in the parts of post, I've got a Model T. Model T Ford. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you couldn't use it only on good weather, you know. We didn't have it. They'd begin to get roads, they'd begin to oil roads, and... So when you, when it was bad weather, you had to go back to your wagon? Yeah. The real, roads were real bad. You, you could, I drove that old Model T through mud after mud, you know, just grinding along. Well, I ruined my back by holding it in. You had to hold it in seconds, you know. And I got my... Uh, Back got to hurting so Dr. Bump said took it and said you wore the cartilage out. So I had a chance to get in the post office and I traded it off. Uh -huh. So how many years were you a rural mail carrier? Eighteen. Eighteen. And then I got in there in twenty nine and I stayed in the post office nineteen years. Did you have the same mail route the whole time you were a rural mail carrier? You know, just before I quit, I got the east route. I had the northwest route, mm -hmm. and the, you had a chance to change, so I changed to the east route about two or three years mm -hmm. after. Was that a better route? Well, well yeah, I thought it was, but it wasn't. <laughs> Did it have about the same number of families on yeah, it? Yeah, they were all about, they were all, they run 26 miles. Yeah, they all of them were about, five of them, they were five. No, they got two and they'd carry them all. Mm -hmm. And with all them that settled in the country, you know. It's a big job now. Mm -hmm. But all these people that are settling, building in the country and well, maybe they have, I guess they have 75 families. Hmm. And it's quite a big job to what it was. How did you meet your wife? She was my pupil at school. Which, the Dighton. At the Dighton School? Yeah. They lived up there. Uh -huh. The Valentine, the Catherine Valentine donated for the park. What was your was wife's name? Daisy. And she was she born in Monticello? Was she born in that far on that place out there? But How old was she when you first she, met her? Fifteen. <laughs> I was eighteen. How long did you date each other? Oh, well, I got going with her after we got out. After she got to be sixteen, we didn't get married till nineteen fifteen. I was nineteen. She went to school till me nineteen seven and eight. Mm -hmm. No, we didn't get we didn't get married. My father died, and I had a family. He was kind of head of the family, you know. Then we didn't get married till nineteen fifteen. Mm -hmm. Last day. What was um what was your first date, do you recall? No. I had a horse and I drove to school. <laughs> we go buggy riding. I don't know. <laughs> you go what riding? Buggy riding. Buggy riding? Yeah. We, no cars uh, no cars then you yeah. everybody had a horse, you know. Uh, and uh, take the girls out on Sunday evening or to church or wherever it was. What did your what did her parents think of her dating her teacher? They never said anything. They didn't mind. I never I never dated her after I got out of there. Uh-huh. Well 
I never dated her until about a year after. Sixteen. I would say it was sixteen, I guess. Uh -huh. And then you weren't married till 1915. Yes. Last day of 1915. So you took care of your um, brothers and sisters? Yes. Yeah. And that's when your family was living in Monticello at yes. that point? Yes. Where did you ask your wife to marry you? Oh, I don't know. I think one time we sled rod. <laughs> I forget. I think it was. <laughs> what kind of wedding did you have? We just went to the preacher and got married and went back to the Sunday school party. Uh, The uh, watch watch party. We got married. Sister Catherine was with, was witness, and we went back to party. And nobody knew it. Nobody. What church was this at? Methodist. And what did you call the party? A watch. Watch party? watch. Oh, a New Year's New Year's watch party. Uh -huh. You know, the last day of the year. Uh huh. Usual. And we moved. I had a. Well, I bought this four acres from here over here to keep my horses, you know, mm -hmm. when I was on a roll out. There was an old house here, and we moved into that. And lived in that. Let's see. The three kids are all born in the old house. Mm -hmm. Three children. And... 1926, I built this house for the old down. Uh -huh. And how many children did you have? Three, two boys and a girl. What were their names? Max, Max Valentine Norris and Norma Lorraine Norris and now Willis Norris. So they grew up right here the whole time? Yeah. Where did yeah. they go to school then? They were in Monsala. And the, the boys graduated from the U of I, both of them. Mm -hmm. And Norma. She went to Normal and she, she married uh, She married a boy from her class, you know, and he went to the war, and, she, and then she separated. Mm -hmm. and married another man, and she graduated from. I don't know whether there was on her in Nevada. She was out there. Mm -hmm. She divorced him while he was in the war. In the in the war. I think it was. Uh, Wedding shouldn't have been in the first place. It was just, uh, they just uh, soldiers, you know. And How did World War One affect your life? Were you in the service? No, I had, I had one child. I was classified 4F, mm -hmm. so I didn't get, I didn't get in the service. What <clears throat> did World War One affect your um, how you could buy food and things? We were we were rationed. I think I had rations. You had. Uh, oh, I don't know what you had. Dude. You don't want to buy certain things, you know. I guess racing cards or whatever you call. Uh -huh. At that point, were you mainly driving? <clears throat> you were still on the rural route. Yeah. Were you mainly driving your car or your horse and buggy? Both. Did you have any trouble getting gas? No. Well, I didn't use much gas. Mm -hmm. No. I was horses mostly. Just when the roads are good. Did the um, 
post office pay for your horses, or did you have to support them? We had to buy them. You had to buy them. Mm -hmm. And they didn't pay you for the food or anything for the horses? No, you just got us. I think it was a thousand dollars we got a year. Uh, no. Would that be a year? Yes. Thousand dollars a year is all we got start in. What did you do when you went to the job that you worked in the post office? I dispatching clerk. Outgoing mail. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This factory over here, what is it? I call it Pepsin. You know what I mean, don't mm -hmm. you? It's not Pepsin. It's a, mm -hmm. I used to call it Sir Pepsin Company. Yeah, Glenbrook. 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 Yeah, now. They had they had thousands and thousands of stuff to dispatch, you know, samples and circulars and all that thing we had to work. They, I don't think they do that anymore. Uh -huh. Did you have to stamp it all by hand? No. Uh, did, we didn't... Nothing but the first class mail went through the, the canceling machine. Uh -huh. Theirs was all... They bought circulars over, they were all prepared and bundled, you know. And samples, samples are all about, about that big. They sent samples of syrup, peps, and all over and over. You had to throw them into the states where they went, socks. Mm -hmm. But the circulars, you, they did them up themselves. They got a special rate, you know. How yeah. often did the uh, mail go out of Monticello? when you started? Well, it was on the Wabash Railroad and the Illinois Central Railroad. Probably, I think it was twice, maybe both ways in the daytime twice and at night you the mail was fixed and fixed up the and left at the depot, you know, and the man. Did you did you have to take it down to the de the depot? No. The they had a messenger that uh -huh. did. He that's all he did. He hauled the mail to and from the depot. Would the train stop when they got the mail? Yes, most of the time, but they had to, they had to, first class pouches they caught on the run, you know. You had to put them up on the thing and they, when they went by, they caught them, you know, and pulled them in the car. Mm -hmm. They didn't stop. Well, where was the train station? Well, it's up where it is now. That was the train station they used yeah, for that? Yeah, that, that same. Same mm -hmm. one. When you started, the post office was located on the square? Yeah, um, the building where that uh, dentist is now, you know, on the east side. Mm -hmm. I was in there only a few months and we moved down to the Building on the corner, you know. Where it was now. the city building. It was city built out in 1912, uh -huh. and it was used as it was built for the post office and other people upstairs, dentists or lawyers or whoever it was. And we we moved down there and we stayed in that building until 1935, and then they built the post office where it's built now. Uh -huh. And we moved, in 1935, we moved to that new post office. So the first post office you were in was next door to the... Next door to the... Where the Winter Roth, the dentist is, the... Yeah, I think, I think that was the building. 
Uh-huh. It was one of either right there or either one of those buildings. I forget. Uh-huh. I couldn't can't tell now. And then the next one we built. The city built that building, you know. Uh-huh. 1912. It was used to rent it to the post office. And I don't know who owned it now. Mm-hmm. Gambled for the gambled only. And the government built the new post office, you know. They built it and we moved down there in nineteen thirty five in the fall. And I remember nineteen thirty five because we moved in the post office at that date. And that was the worst winter we ever had. Snow and the trains were blocked, you know, it couldn't move for Christmas time, you know. It couldn't, snow was drifted all over and the trains couldn't get through. And then for about 10 days or two weeks in January, it was 20 below. Every day it got way down below. Now, I remember, I can remember because it was a, year we moved in the post office, 35 and 36. Mm-hmm. And 36 turned out to be a dry year on the far, on, on the, around the country, you know. Uh-huh. It, we had a c- cold winter weather. What was the um, medical treatment like when you were growing up? Were there very many doctors in the area? We had Doc Bumstead, Doc uh, can't think of his name now. Doc Holmes and Doc Bumstead and Doc uh, that funny did the doctors make house calls generally, or did you? Did the doctors normally make house calls, or did you go to their office? Well, uh, yeah, they made house calls, and you had to go in the office. Uh-huh. All my children were born in that old house. Which old? Your, the old the, house uh, that used to be out. here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Did the doctor come for all the births? Yeah, D- three different doctors. Though. Three different ones. <laughs> three different ones. What other organizations have or clubs have you belonged to in Monticello? Well, I, did, I belong to the community club and and the Modern Woodman Lodge, but and I was in the band. I quit that when I married. I was I didn't have time to fool around going to those things. You know, I, I on a poking mail every day, you know, and... Tell us about the band. How many people were in it? When were you in it? Well, when we moved to town, 1911 to 1914, uh-huh. they, were, they were about 40. Klein's band, it was called. Was it named for a store? Or? Dempsey Klein was named after him. You see, Burgess and Klein run the restaurant. Klein was one of them. Mm-hmm. I'm a restaurant. <laughs> you know, uh, the insurance. The insurance. It's still called Burgess mm-hmm. and Klein. And Dempsey Klein was a musician, and he he had the band, and I got out of it, and they kept going. For quite a few years till high school got to go in and then hey. Was it all men? Yes, most of them. No young ones mm-hmm. like they do now, they're all men. What instrument did you play? Trombone. Trombone. Where did you perform? Oh, we played at the fair and we had tournaments. 
we had two or three tournaments out to the Forest Preserve Park. It was fairground then, you know. Mm -hmm. Two or three tournaments out there, and then we we went places to perform, you know, where they wanted to band. Did you have uniforms? Yes. Was it difficult to um, run your household during the Depression? No, it wasn't me. I was in the post office. We got paid every two weeks. So it didn't matter, right? No, it was just the same. Uh -huh. Good thing we were, I was in the post office. Cause we got our pay every two weeks, you know, and other people didn't have any work. And when they got it for a dollar a day, it was tough. But we were lucky being in the post office. Did you have any money in the banks when they closed? I had had some money in the National Bank and I had my $3,000 loan on my house in the other bank. The Moore Bank? Moore Bank. I had a $3,000 loan on this house that I built. And I never lost any money. I got to see that they transferred that loan to the Pied County loan, you know. Mm -hmm. The bank went under the Pied County loan, took it over, and I got my money out of the National Bank. They paid out. How long were the banks closed? Well, I don't remember. Several years. A few years. Mm -hmm. See. How long did you have to wait to get your money? Did you get it right away or did you have to wait till they reopened? No, well, when they closed, I don't know how. They got they got a man here take them take over, you know, mm -hmm. thing, and he. He collected everything he could, you know, and then we got our money. I, it wasn't too long till I got my money. And then the bank, the Moore Bank, they transferred it to the Pot County Loan. Mm -hmm. They had money, or took them over anyway, and so I didn't lose anything. Of course, the Moore Bank didn't pay out. So the people that had money in the Moore Bank lost their money? Yeah, it only paid out about, oh, 80 percent, I think, something like that. Was that the one that uh, Mr. Dighton was president? No, he was the National Bank. Who was president of the Moore Bank? Well, Dwight Moore was. Well, he wasn't when they closed. His brother... And his son, what was his name, wanted that bank, and Dwight, Dwight got out, let them have it, mm -hmm. and he went to California, and then they, it went under while, while Alan, Alan Moore and his son had it, mm -hmm. his son was running it. And that's that's when the that's when the depression got when the things went under. But those fellows that come here to settle these banks, they didn't have no sympathy, and they sent them in here. <laughs> they got a chance; they'd close you out. Hmm. You know they. I thought I was going to get it, you know. I thought they were going to close me out and take my place, but I, I paid up mm -hmm. my payments. If you said they were too late, they're right after you. You know, and they didn't have no sympathy for you. <laughs> they take your 
property or whatever it was. Did many of your friends lose the property? Yeah. Several, well, several in that national bank, they had to dig up $10,000 directors hmm. to pay, to help pay, you know. Boy, they were bitter about that, too. So the directors themselves had to pay the money? Yeah, I know three, three of them had 10000 I don't know who the others were. Three of the that I knew. One of them, he was bitter. He complained about the way things were. Who was that? His name is Sadler's. Size, what was the last name? Sadler's. S A L Y E R S. Mm -hmm. No, they're not here anymore. Who were some of the others? Does that go on record? If you don't want it to, we can go on. Um, uh, Topman's had to pay up 10000 uh -huh. and, and who was uh, somebody, the three that I knew, but they were more than that. They yeah. had to dig up more money than that. Hmm. Topman and Sawyer's. Did you ever ride on the inter interurban? Yes. Where did you go on it? I rode out in the school one time. Uh, you know, cost me a nickel to ride out there to Dighton. To the um, Dighton's? Yeah. The Dighton the, School? Di yeah, Dighton Crossing there where they stopped. I stayed at Valentine's. Uh -huh. I rode, it cost me a nickel to ride out there. And I, when I was went to normal, I rode the inner urban to Decatur, and then from Decatur to, to Bloomington. Uh -huh. How long did it take to go from Monothel to Decatur? Well, well not very long. Mm -hmm. I would know that they run pretty, pretty good. Of course, they had a lot of stops to make, you know. Oh, I, I couldn't. I couldn't tell you how much time it took. Do you recall how much it cost to ride from Monticello to Decatur? No, I don't remember. Uh -huh. Oh, I remember that nickel. Yeah. There were a lot of nickel rides. You know, you go crossing or people ride in from a crossing into town or back home. And usually a nickel. Was the train fairly much on time always? Yeah, they run. Yeah, they run pretty good. Do you remember when there was another train that went between Monticello and Champaign that you could go in on? Oh, the Illinois Central. You could ride that. Yeah, they they put in a, a stop too, like the interurban. They stop at crossings and. Everything you go from Champaign to Decatur, through Cisco, mm -hmm. and Monticello, Champaign. They they put in those crossing stops too, you know, to to get even with the the interurban. Did they? How long were they open for business doing that? Who? Uh, the um, Illinois oh. Central, how long did they keep that up? Uh, well, a good while. I couldn't tell you just how long, but a good while. They had a uh, man, a deep uh, man there, you know, agent there. You could ride there. Mm. Uh, they went a good while. I just don't remember how long. We'd have, a, they'd have an excursion, the Illinois Center run an excursion from here to Decatur, you know, for certain, for certain things, you know, and you 
go in there and come back on it. I don't remember what the fare was, uh -huh. but you could. Um, when I talked to you originally, you mentioned once you lived out near Hogshoot Bridge. Yeah, that was the Dighton farm. The Dighton. Why did they call that Hogshoot Bridge? Well, it was a long, narrow bridge. More like a hog chute, you know. Oh. Yeah, well, and they call it the hog chute bridge. You know, if you know, if you've seen the hog chute, haven't you? Uh huh. And load up narrow, when they run the, well, it's a narrow bridge and you couldn't pass on it. There's two, two, two spans, I think. Mm hmm. When did you have your first radio? I made the first one. A lot of people made their first ones, you know. You could buy a, a speaker and you could buy other things and put them together. I, I don't know there was any, at that time there was, I don't think there was any made all together. You had to make them. You buy a, speaker and uh, the parts and build it up. That's what I did. When could that be? Were you still living at home or were you married then? Yeah, I was, I was married. Uh -huh. was, when I, we lived in this, I lived in the old house. I just can't tell you what, uh -huh. what year it was, what? but I did it. What? Programs would kind of programs would you get? Well, there's one come from the northern part of music from Elgin, and one come from the prison in Missouri, a piano player, hmm. just music, you know, and that's the two two that you hear, and then you hear K D. What was it, Pittsburgh? K D A something. And you got your radio built and put together with then you so you could get in the, that prison. They wanted to, a fellow was in the prison, you know, and they, everybody wanted him to get out, wanted him free because he was that's a good musician, you know. Yeah, huh. I don't think he got out. How many hours a day did he play? Well, I don't remember. Pretty often. Uh -huh. A lot of music. And then that Elgin, they played a lot of music too, different kinds. And from, from Pittsburgh, I think it was KD, KA or something. You get music. That's about all they got. Uh -huh. Did you enjoy it when they started having the um, more radio programs and shows? What were some of your favorites? Oh, I can't think of the program. The one with Molly and what was that program? F Fibber McGee and Molly. Fibber McGee and Molly. I like listening to them. Then. And others were along at the time. I can't remember what they were now. What president do you recall most vividly? What? What president do you recall most vividly? Oh, I think Theodore Roosevelt when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He he got in and McKinley was shot, you know. He was the one that might speak easy but carry a big stick, you know. And he got things done, I thought. Speak easy but carry a big stick. Yeah. Then, but then he messed up things, you know. The Bull Moose Party. 
after he got out, Taft was running and Roosevelt won the job, you know. Run, run and run again. That was well, third, maybe third time, uh -huh. third. He got in when Kennedy was, he got in the first and then he was elected. And I think the, I think the next one was, they wanted to run Taft and and he they split off, you know, the Bull Moose Party. And, and, and uh, that let President Wilson get in, Democrats. Mm -hmm. They were all Republicans and that let, that split up the Republicans and the Democrats got in and that was Wilson. And uh, I never remember. Wilson said he he kept us out of war. <laughs> and before the before that time out, we were in the war. You remember that? You remember that? Or no, I've, you don't remember. I've read about it though. Uh, uh -huh. yeah, he kept us out of war. So, yeah. that, but but he was in the war. Well, he couldn't help it though. Well, thank you very much. It's been nice talking to you.